our course in Introduction to the Archaeology of Architecture. This week we're going to focus on a couple of topics as they pertain to archaeology and architecture in our current world, um, including conservation, tourism, and religion. So this week in terms of learning objectives, I'm going to quickly go over how our case studies have impacted the modern world, and then we're going to have a discussion about tourism and conservation, uh, because I think when it comes to architecture especially, these two things should be discussed in tandem. I also want to touch on conservation versus restoration, uh, because that is quite the point of contention when it comes to buildings in the archaeological record, and we'll be looking at the site of Knossos to discuss that a little bit. Then I also want to discuss religion as well, uh, specifically with the recent conversion of the Hagia Sophia that I mentioned last week. You'll also notice that I haven't posted any questions for this lecture. I'll be asking you a few throughout the lecture as I usually do when it comes to specific topics, but this week with the final assessment being posted, and hopefully you've all read through that by now, but I want you all to think of your own question this week. So ask yourself something about anything pertaining to the subject matter, either this week or in previous weeks, and I always want you thinking about what defines architecture, but ultimately I want it to be up to you this week. So you can maybe pause the lecture, think about, uh, write down your question, or maybe you've already thought of it, just keep it in the back of your head as we go through the material here. And I'd really love to hear the questions you thought of as well. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to post them in the comments for this lecture. All right, let's hop into the first, our uh, final lecture, sorry, of the course. So as I mentioned in, I think, the first or second lecture, architecture is an integral part of our everyday lives as human beings. And many of the buildings we see today are echoes of this very long past of how humans have been defining our space and, you know, designing our space over time. And this past arguably started with places like Gigantia, our first case study, and in tandem with that, you know, Gobekli Tepe, Stonehenge, these very early forms of architecture that sort of paved the way, pardon the pun, uh, for humans to start, you know, experimenting with architecture and space. And as you can see by the photos on my slide, the three buildings uh, we discussed have had quite the impact since their construction, especially the Parthenon and the Hagia Sophia. And do you recognize any of the architecture in the, uh, from our case studies uh, in the images here? I think the middle one is pretty telling. Uh, the Parthenon is still considered one of the greatest pieces of classical architecture and has inspired countless other styles and it still inst inspires buildings to this very day. Uh, and this included a full-scale model of the Parthenon that was built in Nashville, Tennessee in the United States which is pictured here. Rather impressive. Uh, and the same goes for the Hagia Sophia, which set a precedent for Orthodox architecture, uh, which is still used today, as you can see by this more modern church uh, from the island of Crete. There's still echoes of the Hagia Sophia in the architecture there. And I've also included this photo of the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, uh, because A, it's a beautiful building, but you can also see its direct parallels with the Hagia Sophia, being built in the same city, being built as, you know, rivals, but also sisters almost. Now, obviously these three case studies are not the only buildings that have influenced architecture in the modern day, but all three play a huge role in one modern aspect, and that is tourism. So tourism is a booming modern industry, and historic and ancient buildings play a big role in that, um, as we've already seen with Malta, Athens, and Istanbul. Now, tourism and conservation are almost contradictory to a certain extent, but they do agree to disagree in some respects as well. And as I already mentioned when we discussed Gigantia, uh, they did install walkways to protect the ancient floors, but also so people could interact with the architecture on a more intimate level. And this is unlike places like Stonehenge, which only allow you to view the stones from very far away behind a barrier. Now, this practice of controlling the flow of movement of people through ancient buildings has its benefits, and I would argue also its downsides. Now, in terms of upsides, it prevents the destruction of the monuments uh, that can be caused by issues related to tourism, such as vandalism and various forms of refuse left behind, 
I know litter has been a big issue and continues to be a big issue at a lot of archaeological sites, uh, especially Stonehenge, which was actually one of the contributing factors behind the uh, lack of accessibility there is now at the site. So in terms of tourism, this can also include environmental damage. And this ranges from the high concentration of humans breathing in one space, so the moisture and oxygen and carbon dioxide all in one enclosed space. It's, it's really bad for interiors especially. And, you know, the oils from our hands as we touch things, so as a bunch of people touch one surface over time, it can really lead to its degradation. And on a larger scale, uh, there's obviously the issue of pollutants. Uh, from cars, buses, planes, uh, boats, etc. And this is especially prevalent in places like Athens and Istanbul, where a good chunk of that pollution also comes from the tourism industry as well as the large populations. Now, in terms of downsides, other than the you know, lack of accessibility to really experience the site as it was meant to be experienced, um, and, you know, learn a little bit more by being able to see things um, up close. Another issue I find is that a lack of funding or interest in a site can actually cause it to become dilapidated and decay. So I have touched on Rome a bit with the Arch of Constantine, but I thought a good example of both of these issues is the Mausoleum of Augustus. Uh, thank you to Raphael for the recommendation in Google Classroom. So. This structure served multiple purposes over the course of its, it, its existence. The first being that it was built as a resting place for Rome's first emperor, Augustus, in 28 CE. And this is pretty much smack dab in the middle of the construction of the Parthenon and the construction of the Hagia Sophia, uh, time-wise. So it acted as uh, a mausoleum, a crypt, a place of, you know, to lay the dead to rest. Uh, for almost 200 years after uh, the death of Augustus, and this excluded uh, the infamous Emperor Nero, <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons, I think. And it served many purposes over the years, and this included being a fortress in the Middle Ages, uh, a rich family in Rome converted it into a garden in the 1700s, and it even acted as a concert hall in the early 20th century. I found this uh, kind of interesting because this says something about uh, the building's acoustics, even though it was originally meant as a place, uh, you know, to lay the dead to rest. So it's just an interesting phase in the building's history, I think, you know, brought back to life with music. So it ceased to be a concert hall under Mussolini in the 1930s, and it was technically going to be part of his large restorative propaganda project in Rome. Uh, where he was using prominent buildings from Rome's past to kind of solidify his rule. And this included buildings such as the Colosseum. And the mausoleum, again, was meant to be a part of this, but it was never addressed. And due to the fact that it ceased to be a concert hall, it actually lay fairly derelict for multiple decades. And it only officially reopened to the public in 2021, after nearly, I think, 50 years of being closed to the public. Uh, so in effect, I guess where tourism and conservation agree to disagree, tourism saved this building because it became a new part of the industry in Rome, but it was only able to become a part of that industry through conservation, through, you know, a facelift, I guess, pretty much. Uh, so thank you again to Raphael for that recommendation. I think it was a perfect example of tourism and conservation at work. Now, I have spoken a bit about restoration and conservation, but what is the difference? Is there a difference? Conservation um, or preservation is the attempt to preserve something in its current state, whereas restoration is the attempt to restore or reconstruct something to its original state or to, you know, a phase in its existence. Now, as you can imagine, this is quite a point of contention in the archaeological, uh, archaeological community today, especially when it comes to architecture. And we've already touched on this a bit, especially in our discussions about the palimpsest, but with the Parthenon, 
there is almost that need to preserve that one original phase from the 5th century BCE. And the conservation projects seem to focus on this phase. Uh, and, you know, this is sort of related to tourism as well. But I wanted to pose the question to you, is what they're doing on the Acropolis now, is that conservation or is it restoration? Something to think about. And another place I thought of uh, that I think direct, uh, relates directly to this discussion is the Palace of Knossos on the island of Crete. Uh, if you've ever been, you will see that a lot of the frescoes and some of the architecture has been restored. And this was commissioned by Arthur Evans back in the early 1900s after excavating the site. And it was for visitors to see the palace as it once was. And it drew a lot of attention uh, from visitors to the island of Crete. And this is one of those cases where the debate between restoration and con conservation to a certain extent almost falls flat on its face, depending on your opinion. So the restoration may be slightly interpretive, uh, at the best in some instances, but what it did is it drew crowds and it allowed for the continued preservation of the site. So when you compare that with what happened to the Mausoleum of Augustus, which as soon as its purpose ceased uh, and restoration never happened, it fell into disrepair and could no longer be appreciated by the public. So in regards to tourism and conservation slash restoration, there is a fine balance between them and in the middle, I think, is our ability to see more of these buildings and to understand more about the past as it progressed up until the moment that we stepped into those buildings. Now, religion is kind of its own separate uh, point, but it does relate directly back to both tourism and conservation. I did pose this question to you last week. Should religious space be respected as such? or should its history also be honored in the process? As I mentioned, the Hagia Sophia was converted uh, back into a mosque in 2020. And as far as I know from my research, you can still visit the site. Um, however, you are asked to remove your shoes as is customary in mosques, and you must be uh, quiet and respectful to those um, at prayer at, uh, while you're visiting. So what's your opinion on this? Uh, I think, personally, uh, that as long as, you know, the history and the, you know, art and architecture uh, remains accessible to people who don't practice Islam, I don't see anything wrong with this. I think it's also kind of cool to be able to experience a space while it functions as one of its, you know, past functions. So a place of prayer, a place of worship. It provides you with a more intimate experience, I think, not only with the building, but with the past as well. So instead of the hustle and bustle of tourists, you, you really do experience the space differently. So you can take in the light and the acoustics in a context that they were meant to be, you know, experienced. And, you know, those are my thoughts, and I am curious to hear yours as well. Something I would like to point out as well is that there are plenty of other places of worship that are popular tourist destinations. So the first thing that comes to mind are the medieval cathedrals uh, scattered across Europe, or even the Orthodox Church I visited in Crete, uh, the picture I posted on one of the earlier slides. So there are plenty of active uh, places of worship that also act as tourist destinations. And I think ultimately it comes down to respect and respect is one of those primary factors behind the conservation of buildings like the Hagia Sophia. To kind of summarize, history belongs to everyone, uh, but so does the present. So, you know, just as buildings are palimpsest, you as an individual are also a palimpsest. So you're a culmination of your own experiences and those of your ancestors as well. So these were my sources this week. I highly recommend uh, Thomas Downson's blog, Archaeology Travel, uh, but I will post more about that in additional materials later this week. And that concludes our course. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to learn with me. I've really enjoyed this and getting to know you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the course. 
And remember, there's a bunch of other courses and resources offered by Save Cultural Heritage Group uh, if you want to keep learning. A uh, quick reminder that I have posted about the final assignment. Uh, please post any questions uh, you have beneath or feel free to email me as well. I want the assignment to be very casual. And remember, you can ask yourself your own question for the assignment as well. Just specify that in the assignment. And I'm really looking forward to reading all of your work and uh, reading your insights and to see what you've taken away from this course. So thank you again, everyone, so much. And have a great rest of your day.